Welcome and thanks for joining us at the virtual British Library for tonight's event with Mariana Mazzucato and Gillian Tett as they discuss Mariana's new book, Mission Economy. I'm B. Rolat of the Cultural Events team and we're delighted to welcome Mariana back following her two sold out lecture series for the library in 2018 and 2019. This event is part of the programme for our current exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, which charts two centuries of that battle and the extraordinary women who led it. Um, our galleries are of course currently closed but we are open online and all of our brilliant events past and future are available there. Please look at the website. I'm very grateful to Gillian Tett for hosting this conversation and she joins us from New York where she's the US editor-at-large for the Financial Times. Over to you Gillian. Well, thank you very much indeed and good evening to all of you who are watching this event in London or if you're sitting where I am right now in New York, where it's actually snowing out the window, good afternoon. Or good morning if you're in Asia and a fan of Mariana or anywhere else in the world. It's great to have you with us. And it's particularly great to have a chance to be here chatting with Mariana about such an incredibly timely topic, which is how on earth do we actually get out of the current mess we're in by harnessing not just the private sector, which we keep talking about so much, or you certainly do if you're with the Financial Times, but also going back to that seemingly quite old fashioned idea of the state. Now, Mariana's official biography um, sounds fabulous. Her official biography reads, she's a professor in the economics of innovation and public value at University College London, where she is founding director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, and advises policymakers around the world on innovation-led inclusion and sustainable growth. She's particularly advising the Italian government, insofar as the government is a government, it keeps changing, um, the Scottish government and the South African government as well. So amazingly poor brush. But that official bio doesn't really explain her significance because I've seen Mariana for years striding around the corridors of events like the World Economic Forum in Davos, which normally should be happening right now. In fact, it's now happening on Zoom, but it's not quite the same. And Mariana is amazing because she's a trained economist. She knows how to speak the lingo of economics, um, geek speak writ large, but she has a way of lighting up the debate and the room by tossing out some pretty controversial ideas and still making sure the policymakers keep sp speaking to her. She has a way of challenging and sometimes being quite provocative or very provocative and yet staying in the debate. And that's what I think this book is going to be doing. And I, that's what we're going to be talking about now because very cleverly, she's rooted it in an event from history, which frankly, everybody loves to love. No one can say they hate the idea of Jack Kennedy. Nobody can say they dislike the idea of his amazing effort to revitalize America back in the 1960s. In fact, her book, which I've got a galley of, which is covered in scribbles right here, <laughs> and very old fashioned, very 20th century, a bit of paper, but I still love paper, um, starts off by saying in 1962, in a famous speech at Rice University, President John F. Kennedy announced the US government was set out on the, quote, most hazardous and dangerous and greatest adventure on which man has ever embarked. And it goes on to talk about the moon landing and how that occurred against all odds. And she talks about that being in some ways a parallel to what we need today in terms of the boldness of, of ambition, the vision, the commitment, the spending of the money, and one hopes the ultimate success. So that's the gist of the book. But let me start by saying, Mariana, welcome. Great to see you. Where Thank are you talking you. from? I'm talking to you from Camden, where I've got uh, four kids in the house Zooming, so hopefully the broadband will <laughs> be strong <laughs> enough. <laughs> well, if if uh, doubt, for a minute, they can join the party too. Exactly. Um, but thank but, you, Gillian, for agreeing to you know, host this. It's wonderful to be with you. Well, it's great. It's great to be talking to you. I'm just very sad we can't be mm. um, either face-to-face -face in London or Camden, all sloshing around the snow in Davos, eating ghastly canapes <laughs> and poking fun at mm. all the... Um, cabbage patch dolls, I call them the middle-aged men running the world. So there we go. But um, let me start by asking you, great book, why did you write it and why now? <laughs> 
So maybe I'll start with Davos because I really wrote it for two reasons. One has to do with government and one has to do with business. So given that you've just talked about the snow and the, uh, the, the men in Davos, um, you'll and know- there are, some great, there are some great men, I should say. I'm not- <laughs> I'm just saying that the ratio, Mariana and I- Definitely, totally definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll know, and you know, I'm sure the, the audience has heard that there's all this talk about purpose that we need a more purposeful type of business. Uh, this week with the Davos Agenda, I was actually on a session, the opening session with Klaus Schwab about his wonderful new book called Stakeholder Capitalism. And you know, for me, what this book does, and part of the reason I wrote it is to say, fine, fantastic. Of course, we need a new form of corporate governance. We know all the reasons why the current form isn't working. You know, $4 trillion having uh, been spent just on buying back shares in the last 10 years by large global companies instead of reinvesting it back into the economy. However, we need to go beyond this notion of purpose as a corporate governance issue and bring it really to the center of the system, how we actually design our capitalist system, because we should always remember that there's varieties of ways of doing capitalism. And what's really interesting about the Apollo program and just kind of what it represented, and I do hope we have a chance to talk about why the book is not about cutting and pasting that, is that there was a real kind of central purpose in how business and government, so NASA alongside you know, General Electric, Honeywell, Motorola, many different companies invested and innovated and actually you know, accomplished this amazing feat, which is almost hard to think of today given all the problems we have even just of you know, producing enough PPE on earth <laughs> of going to the moon and back again in one generation. And you know, that notion of purpose at the center means how government and business relate one to another. So it's a question of governing the private sector and the public sector and their interrelationships. But you know, my main work in terms of the applications of my research, I'm an academic, it has been mainly in the past with governments. So the other reason I wrote the book is that I feel that there's a real thirst for doing things differently. There's a dissatisfaction with how really policy has been designed or misaligned, misdesigned in terms of not really being able to play a proactive role in the economy. You know, all the challenges we face where, uh, whether it's climate change, the health pandemic, the digital divide, or any of the 17 sustainable development goals, which we should remember every country in the world basically has signed up to, that requires organizational competence. And if you have bought into the idea that government at best is to fix market failures, at best, you know, some say worse, get the hell out of the way. So at best, fix market failures when they arise, it actually becomes quite hard to even have a justification for investing within your public organization to develop, you know, innovative potential, knowledge creation, uh, activities, ability to learn through trial and error and error and error, right? Venture capitalists always brag about how they experiment and, you know, fail as many times as they succeed. When government fails, it's on the front page of the Daily Mail or the equivalent in New York or globally. So really the book is about kind of looking at the Apollo program and all the investments that occurred through the public sector, how it actually directed the challenge and how it partnered with business in a really confident symbiotic way and all the experimentation that it required, including how to actually design our budgets differently, right? How to think about the outcome. So outcomes-based budgeting, instead of saying, oh, we have this amount of money, what can we do with it? What's the goal? And then working backwards, how much money do we actually need? And how do we catalyze as much private sector investment along the way? Right. I mean, these are, I should say, by the way, anyone who's watching, do feel free to start sending in questions really as soon as you want, because I want to try and open it up to the audience and bring in questions as early as I can because it's such provocative ideas and they have to get out to such a wide range of people that I'd love to try and open this up to dialogue. But um, a point you make about, you know, saying, okay, let's think about government. I mean, that has been staggeringly unfashionable for the last couple of decades. I mean, in the US, that wonderful tag, the worst eight words in English language or seven words are, <laughs> I'm from the government, I'm here to help you know, or the very fact that, you know, almost everywhere you look, you know, government's been taken out of the equation in terms of what people respect. Um, I remember the late Paul Volcker, um, the former Ooh. chair of the Federal Reserve, one of the things he did in the last few years of his life was to create and support this training academy um, at um, Harvard to try and get civil servants trained up and respected 
and smarter and he could barely find anybody who was willing to put money into it really um, oh yeah it was oh that's fascinating yeah 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 no he in fact he, he talked a lot about it so i'm kind of curious you know how do you get that zeitgeist shift you know mm. is there any chance of people taking government seriously well first of all i th- you know people do take government seriously the problem is what do they take government seriously for Right. So already with the financial crisis, we know that, you know, governments basically bailed out the capitalist system. Unfortunately, most of that money that went in, which was welcome, everyone, you know, welcomed the liquidity injection, which you yourself you know, wrote a lot about post financial crisis. Most of that money just ended up back in the financial sector in the UK, where, you know, where I live, where you sometimes live, something like 80 percent of finance ends up back in the financial sector. Only about 20% even goes into the real economy. But so many different types of government programs, whether it's grants, loans, procurement, don't actually catalyze anything really interesting. They don't make what economists would call additionality happen. So making investments happen that wouldn't have anyway. So it's not that government, you know, that people or businesses, for example, don't believe in government. They believe in it for, you know, helping them out when they have problems, whether that's a financial crisis and they need to get bailed out, or whether it's, you know, the steel sector, which today is begging for money globally to get bailed out, not because of COVID, but because it's a sort of dying industry unless it transforms. The question is, how do we transform the everyday that government does do, even those that don't believe in government are benefiting from the everyday things that government does to actually be really ambitious and bold. You know, so just an example that I'm working on just to kind of bring it down from the moon to super earth kind of neighborhood level. I'm chairing um, the Camden Renewal Commission with Georgia Gould, who's a labor counselor, leader of Camden Council, which is a part of London. And we've set up the Camden Renewal Commission. So what we're trying to do is to focus on really concrete problems that London has, for example, knife crime, which has been uh, really growing in terms of its, you know, in- incredible uh, uh, rise, and it, it's just terrible. It's, it, it's it's afflicting particular types of young, mainly boys, um, and there's just so little support. I mean, this is an era for the last ten years, as you'll know, that we've had lots of austerity. But the word austerity kind of misses the point. We need to look at what has been cut. So mental health services, youth centers, local libraries, and so on. So what does it look like to tackle a problem like knife crime? not simply by saying, oh, spend, you know, give a bit of money here to use services, a bit of money here to schools and after school programs and policing, but actually to say, this is a problem. We need to, you know, have a mission around it. So zero is not a bad number, <laughs> zero knife crime amongst young teenagers, because the boys who are dying are between like the age of 13 and 17. And what does that mean for how we work together, for how we do the budgeting, for how we resource it, for how the procurement um, you know, of different government services works in terms of actually being goal oriented. You can bring it up a notch and say, what does that mean for a city when it has a carbon neutral kind of sustainable city agenda? Even another notch up if you bring it globally to the fact that, you know, we have so much plastic in the ocean. Uh, one of the SDGs is about life underwater. But if you just leave it at that very broad challenge, like life underwater or climate change, it's really hard to know what to do. There's no kind of clear investment pathway. So when you create a really clear mission, like going to the moon and back again, the challenge, of course, at the time was Sputnik and the space race and beat the Russians. Had they left it at that, nothing would have happened, right? So a very clear targeted mission, which however then is designed, and this is the key point, I bring back the word designed, designed in such a way that really catalyzes as much intersectoral innovation and investment across the economy. To get to the moon, it was not just aeronautics. There was huge amounts of investment in materials, nutrition, Um, electronics, the whole software industry as we know it today, the modern software industry basically traces its uh, history to that mission. So equally, any sort of climate related mission today would involve investment and innovating in construction equipment and transport and nutrition, of course, in renewable energy and so on. But then again, the design question is, you know, what does it mean about doing things differently? So instead of just giving out money to random categories like small, medium enterprises, or the life sciences strategy, or a list of sectors. In the UK, for example, we had a list of sectors up until recently that included life sciences, uh, automotive, aerospace, um, creative industries, and financial services. It's like, to do what? And why didn't you include all sorts of other sectors, right? So instead of focusing on sectors, what does it look like to focus on problems? 
So this was one of the real kind of big policy impacts I had recently with my team as we convinced the UK government to really choose concrete uh, uh, challenges that they were facing instead of focusing on um, sectors. And they chose clean growth, aging, future mobility, and the kind of opportunities around data. And then we worked with them to formulate different, again, missions underneath those. But the real issue here is how do you get, you know, uh, activity occurring across the economy, crowding in as many different types of investment um, and innovations kind of bottom up. And here I'll pause in just a second. I think this is where the biggest misunderstanding is sometimes with the book, unless one actually kind of reads the whole book. This is not about top down, big government, heavier government, more money and the state kind of telling everyone what, um, everyone what, everyone what to do. It's more about setting a direction for change. The government providing kind of an investor first resort role, but then designing its instruments to be as catalytic to drive bottom up innovation across the business sector, as well as um, charities. Right, right. Interesting. So basically it's about ambition, targeting, collaboration, and government as catalyst, rather than implement it all the time or execute all the time, which is a interesting combination. I'm getting some really terrific questions already from the audience. So please do keep sending them in because I'm going to weave them together. And it's always great for someone like me to kind of get a broader vision about what we want to ask Mariana. But um, before I do two quick questions, one, is there any government in the world which is actually doing this that we can look mm. to and say, I want to be just like them? Because, you know, many of us have got new <laughs> MB these days. Um, or, you know, think that parts of Singapore look fabulous, apart from the authoritarian nature of it. Is there anywhere that you think actually gets it more than anywhere else that we should be looking to for encouragement? Um, and secondly, which sectors or topics or issues would you start with right now? Um, or do you not want to start with any particular mm. thematic area of focus? You know, is COVID-19 going to be the area? Because even in Trump's America, we, we managed to get a modicum of collaboration between public and private over making some PPE pretty inefficiently, yep. but it was there. You know, should we be saying COVID-19 or is climate change going to be the big moment yep. where we actually are forced to bang heads together and get public-private partnership? Yeah, great questions. And I just realized I didn't answer your previous one. So I'll just quickly answer that one in terms of what Volcker advocated for. That's the reason I actually set up the Institute that I'm running at University College London, which is what is the curriculum? What is the new training, the new mindset that we actually need within the civil service globally in order to move forwards in this direction? Because the current training has basically been done through this idea of public choice theory, new public management, which is not only driven by this notion, as I mentioned, of at best fixing markets, but even the idea that even worse than market failure is government failure. So occupy as little space as you can and then get the hell out of the way. So what does it look like to design a curriculum as we have around kind of four different big areas around collective value creation, challenge led innovation, creative bureaucracies, and really governing our digital platforms for the public good. So coming to your question, I mean, you know, in terms of government. Where and what? Those are the two questions. Yeah. So I've been working actually quite um, closely with Sweden because Sweden has a really interesting mission, which goes to the heart of something that I really believe in, which is we need to reinvent and resource the welfare state, but not in, you know, not in a folkloric way, just the, you know, the beverage moment of saying, oh, we need to invest more in public education and public health. Of course we do, but how? And they have this wonderful mission of a fossil free welfare state. So the idea that actually everything that government does from public education, which of course includes very specific things, including school meals, which as you'll know, or some of your audience may know in the UK now is a very hot topic because we actually needed a footballer from Manchester United, Marcus Rashford, a, a fantastic footballer to remind the government how important uh, resourcing school meals um, is during the lockdown and also during holiday periods in such a crisis moment where that's often the only meal that, uh, that some get kids get um, you know, um, during the day because of child poverty. How do you transform something like school meals to be an avenue for innovation, an avenue for actually reaching our carbon neutral targets, right? So instead of thinking of carbon neutrality, sustainability and the Green New Deal as this area in the economy that we call green, what does it mean to have a green direction to everything we do? Something as simple as the school canteen. So I think Sweden has been really interesting around that. But also, I mean, I was really surprised in how Greg Clark, um, Greg Clark was the minister of Bayes, the ministry here for business 
environment and the industrial strategy in the previous government of Theresa May, they really opened up to some of these ideas. So we worked very closely with them to bring again a challenge oriented approach instead of a sector driven approach to the industrial strategy. And today, uh, still now with Boris Johnson's government, even though they're so distracted with Brexit or globally as many governments are with COVID, but there still are teams within the Ministry for Business and Industrial Strategy focused on you know, challenges, right? So the, uh, the uh, clean growth agenda, the healthy aging agenda. And so, and in some ways they're experimenting with it in a way that's really quite pathbreaking. So for example, there has been um, discussions within the treasury, so the Ministry of Finance, to actually evaluate public investments in a different way. One of the key points in my book that I make is that, you know, had the moon landing been evaluated uh, ex, you know, ex post, but also ex ante by the cost benefit analysis or the net present value calculation, it would have never begun, right? So what does it mean when we think about all it took to get to the moon and all the different spillovers that happened along the way, including most of the things that make our, you know, iPhone smart and not stupid, what does it mean to actually be able to evaluate those dynamic spillovers as a government, you know, a, a, a treasury team in order to know kind of, you know, did something succeed or not? Um, and so, you know, I don't like to say any one country is perfect. I think what's really interesting is at the organizational level, uh, whether a particular team within a government or a particular type of collaboration on a project is really being done in a fundamentally radically different way from what we're used to. And what we're used to, again, is this notion that first you need to say where, market, where the market is failing, and that then justifies your intervention. And the BBC, lastly, I should uh, mention, I've personally been learning a lot from the BBC, the public broadcaster uh, in Britain, as an organization that has thought about some of these issues. They've never accepted to just you know, fix the market. They've always said, actually, we're also going to invest in areas where business is investing. So soap operas and talk shows, not just documentaries and high quality news. But in doing that, they've had a discussion about notions of public value, something I come to in the conclusion of my book. Um, and so that, you know, doing a, a, a soap opera about the working class, EastEnders, is very different from the dynasty kind of Dallas, you know, form of soap opera. And the conversations that occurred within the BBC when they were making those investments were very much at the core of the kind of things we're talking about. Wow, I bet everyone wishes they were a fly on the wall. <laughs> fascinating. And um, that really is, you know, where our sort of, you know, you know, binge watching of television confronts public policy writ large. But anyway, <laughs> um, but this is getting some great questions. Oh, sorry, COVID. I'll just say something really quickly with COVID. Co I mean, climate change, that was the thing I wanted to ask, COVID or climate yeah, change. Yeah, COVID and climate change. So the whole, I mean, throughout the book, I keep saying that that's a false dilemma. So if you look at, again, the question of the how, right? Not the what, Government is always investing, it's always pouring money in, but it's the how that matters. So if you look at the COVID recovery schemes globally, which are huge, um, in Japan, it was over a trillion you know, dollars worth in the US close to, depends what actually is then negotiated, but let's just say $2 trillion. In Europe, we have this big European recovery scheme. Um, what we're seeing this time around, which we didn't see with the financial crisis, is the greater willingness to create conditions attached to these recovery packages, which are COVID-19 recovery packages, to be conditional on transformation. Um, and you know, this is something I've been arguing for for a long time pre-COVID, and it's been so interesting to see it implemented. And the question is, what does it look like to then normalize that post-COVID? But in some countries, it hasn't happened at all. So whereas in France, the recovery package that went to Air France and Renault was conditional on those uh, companies reducing their carbon uh, emissions as part of literally the contract, or in Denmark and Austria, their recovery package was conditional, conditional on not using tax havens. In the UK, we gave a condition-free massive bailout to EasyJet. So, you know, this comes back to the issue of varieties of capitalism. So how can green and sustainability targets be at the core of how we design that public-private interface, whether it's a bailout a grant or a loan. And I mentioned the steel industry before, way pre-COVID, about three years ago, uh, the German steel industry was asking for money by, uh, to the uh, German government. And I found it really interesting how, because they had a mission, imperfect, it's not perfect, it's not about glorifying any government, but they had a mission around green called the Energiewende. The loan that was provided to the steel sector through their public bank was conditional 
on the steel sector lowering its material content, which then the how, how they did it was up to them. So they innovated massively the repurpose, reuse, recycle of, of the entire steel chain. And today they, are one of the, they have one of the most innovative steel sectors, not because they went to Davos and talked about purpose, but because they had to in order to access that loan. And that's what I mean by bringing purpose to the center of the system instead of just a corporate governance issue. And this is, you know, this is what we're seeing with COVID right now. Also the conditions on the vaccine is very interesting and that's not happening by the way. So it's not enough to invest in something as great as a vaccine is. And we all are hoping and praying, you know, that everyone globally can get vaccinated. But unless you govern that process, again, at the public private interface to make sure that patents are not abused, that the prices of the dosages are actually reflecting the huge also public contribution to the vaccine. So citizens benefit from something they've also, you know, financed, you know, all those different types of issues, which have always been plaguing the health industry because it's, it's a problematic partnership we've seen in the past. This is the moment to get that right. Right. Well, by the way, I forgot to mention earlier that if you want to buy Mariana's book, um, <laughs> Mission Economy is available to purchase by visiting the books tab at the top of the screen. So I just have a message from the organizers to remind you all of that. It wasn't um, my message. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. But, you know, the organizers are keen. I should let you all know where to find the book if you want to buy it. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, we've got terrific range of questions. So let me start working through some of them, which is some of these are economic, some of the about economics, some of these are practical, some of these are a bit um, questioning some of the theories behind it, mm -hmm. some of it are asking about what this means for um, private sector. Mm. But um, let's start with a really basic one from someone called Paul, who says, you speak so much common sense, but what obstacles are there in the government and public slash pri private sectors that stop outcomes-based governance? What's mm. stopping? And I should say that this actually does match with nice another question from Edward saying, are silos, um, departmental sectors, interest groups, actively preventing focus on outcomes how can those silos be busted? So take them separately or together, but they're quite- Yeah, busted. interesting. So they're related, yeah. I mean, my experience is that the bottleneck, what's kind of impeding government from moving forwards is that they, or they, you know, civil servants or the leaders also on the top have bought into this notion that at best, as I mentioned, they're there to fix markets or using more sexy lingo, de-risk the private sector. And already that is a problem, right? This notion that you're, enabling, leveling the playing field, fixing markets, de-risking, de-risking who? The risk takers. You know, what the Apollo program was about was sharing a huge amount of risks, taking risks. You know, you'll know from the astronauts that died through the different uh, missions. So, you know, really remembering that in order to co-create value, which by the way, I think has to be at the center of any stakeholder governance approach. It's not about just sharing the value. It's actually about admitting that different actors in the economy, not just business, create value. What does that actually mean for your organizational governance? What does it mean for your risk averseness, your also investments that you're making? And, and here it's really interesting, and in, again, in the UK, I live here, so that's why unfortunately many of my examples will be from here, but I see trends of this all over the world, this huge amount of outsourcing that governments have um, made to the private sector to consulting companies in particular, the Deloitte's, the KPMG's, the PricewaterhouseCoopers, uh, to do kind of the project management of so many different challenges they face, that in itself is not a problem as long as you're also investing in your own brain along the way. And it was a, a, a Tory Lord recently, Lord Agnew, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, who you know, said, look, you, you've outsourced so much that you have infantilized government, you've infantilized Whitehall, he, he argued. You've turned government into a baby that doesn't know what to do. And I think this is really one of the biggest impediments that if government stops actually investing in its own brain, it actually has no idea, not only what to do, but even how to partner with the private sector. And again, there's a whole section of the book where I go through what that actually looked like in the 1960s. And what was so interesting was that there was a, the head of procurement in, um, in uh, NASA, I think his name was Ernest Brackett, he said, we need to be careful basically about that problem. He said, we need to be careful about brochuremanship, simply kind of, you know, bringing in the private sector for the sake of it, just because of a sexy, today we would you know, call it a PowerPoint. They didn't have PowerPoints back then. We need to really partner with, you know, businesses that are going to engage with us with the mission that we have. And they really then focus on procurement, how to design these 
procurement contracts that were goal oriented, but really keeping it very open on the how. And right. so that again is, I think, a huge impediment. And um, the silos, you know, are related to that. So if you have, you know, each department thinking about its role, so the Department of Energy here, Department of Innovation, and the Ministry of Finance, which in the end always rules the roost, right? It's always it comes down to the treasuries and the ministries of finance to decide how much money is available for any program. You know, that's already a problem. Instead of getting a real kind of horizontal discussion of the challenges that are that a country or globally that we're facing around health, around the digital divide, around climate and so on. And then working backwards, what does that mean for the economy? What does that mean for how we think about our budget? What does that mean for how we design procurement grants and loans and so forth? That's missing and that's you know, a silo. Um, and you know, sometimes it's also a technological issue. I mean, I've experienced this here again where we had government digital services try to create a common website for government, it's called gov.uk. It was actually created by an iPlayer team, iPlayer being a technology for, um, for uh, 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 where the BBC puts all its uh, programs, radio and TV on the internet. Um, it was actually an iPlayer team that set it up and won an international design award. But what they really wanted to do through that was to change how government could really work outside of its silos and use the power of technology and digitalization to get a much more horizontal and dynamic communication between departments, which actually never happened. Hmm. That's a tragedy. Because tragedy. each department wanted to continue to work with their own system. That's an absolute tragedy. I mean, I wrote a whole book myself about the problems of silos and how mm. you break them down and how hard that is. But just turning to some other problems which might be impeding this, we got two other great questions, which is firstly from Edward. Um, politicians are giving li given little to no or even negative credit for thinking long-term, thinking yeah. big and then navigating their way to success through learning from mistakes along the way. Mostly they are dinged by the press, if in doubt, blame a journalist, um, <laughs> for failing to be across some detail that they have no control over. So how can we change the turn of discourse so that we ask politicians to leave with vision and also humility? And we have a related question, which is actually very similar from Barry saying, how might we effectively combine the concept of a government-led mission economy with a five-year general election cycle? So how yeah. do you put your brilliant ideas into practice when you have the mucky media and the reality of political you know, cycles and elections getting in the way? Hmm. So great questions. And I think the answer to both has both an organizational and kind of structural aspect and then a storytelling one. <laughs> So kind of the comms side of it. I'll start with the latter. You know, I was really struck in the US when the US government, after the financial crisis, there was an 800 billion stimulus package that Obama um, set up. He wanted initially to have it be green directed. Uh, then all the Tea Party issues happened, but at least initially it was very ambitious. And it was so ambitious that he managed to convince a Nobel Prize winning physicist, Steve Chu, to come and direct the Department of Energy. So a Nobel Prize winning physicist at Stanford became a civil servant, right? He would never have come in if the idea was come in and de-risk Elon Musk or you know, create some sort of carbon tax. What he was tasked to do was to help the government direct its stimulus package. So that's the good part of the story. Second part is as part of that, he set up ARPA-E, which was basically a sister organization to DARPA, which is in the Department of Defense, but this was in the Department of Energy. You'll know that DARPA was on one of the main uh, innovators around the internet, which again, without that, we wouldn't have anything smart. Um, and, and he ended up hiring a very ambitious guy called Arun Majumdar to run it. Um, and what they did then in the DOE was they started to provide guaranteed loans to different companies that would be part of this portfolio of activity for a green direction. One of those companies was Solyndra. And Solyndra became famous worldwide. Why? Because it failed. And all the backlash against government, this is the kind of communications part, actually, it's also a structural bit, all the backlash was, oh my God, another picking winners problem, another Concord, you know, these examples that people seem to rehash out every time you talk about the state taking an ambitious role. And two things are interesting there. First, yes, Solyndra did fail. Yes, it received a 500 million guaranteed loan, but so did Tesla. Part of the portfolio was also Tesla. There was lots of different companies that the government was thinking about how do we actually spread kind of the risk of the DOE in terms of its guaranteed loans across different types of 
organizations that are going to be helping the U.S. kind of transform in a, in a green direction. So there was no talk about that. You never heard an Obama speech saying, oh, yeah, sorry, we screwed up there. But, you know, it's inevitable. Every time you have a success, you might, you know, mess up six or seven times. But we need to be willing to take those risks if we're going to have a green direction. Second, we didn't have a structure within that portfolio to make sure that the government could, because it's taking risks, the taxpayer had to bail out Solyndra, um, any notion that we need to structure this portfolio in such a way that the government, and so the taxpayer isn't just you know, bailing out the losers, but also getting some sort of upside from the successes. And strangely, even though he had all these Goldman Sachs guys in government, what he ended up, Obama, well, I'm saying Obama, but obviously the people in charge told Tesla, if you don't pay back the loan, we get 3 million shares in your company. Had he said, we get 3 million shares in your company if you're successful and pay back the loan, which of course they did, the price per share went from nine to 90. That multiplied by 3 million would have more than paid back the Solyndra loss, right? So, but you know, just the fact that there was no kind of storytelling about, yeah, 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 okay, guys, don't worry, the guys meaning citizens, <laughs> don't worry, this is part of a portfolio to improve, to build back better, right, post financial crisis. Um, and you know, don't worry, because we also have some, su some successes and you will get back you know, a share of that success. That's kind of two sides of that same problem, including the fact that when countries aren't doing that, this is a country that is making the investments, right? The US has been, as I talked about in my previous book, The Entrepreneurial State, has actually talked the talk of you know, a free market, but actually has been a very heavy investor. The government has heavily invested in everything that became Silicon Valley. In many countries, they don't do that, right? And so that kind of fear of even making that first step of taking the risks is that other kind of you know, problem. And the fact that we have government organizations, as the question asked, that are wed to the electoral cycle is itself a problem because if you want long-termism to think about all the goals we have, you know, whether it's climate or all the different SDG related goals, that's gonna take more than four or five years. That's why it's also really important to think about the structure of public organizations like DARPA, which don't follow necessarily the electoral cycle and in fact welcome people to come in, often scientists through secondment. So they come in for five years, they're actually told explicitly to take risks. That's how they're actually evaluated. I've spoken quite a bit over the last 10 years to people running ARPA, E and DARPA, how they actually attract you know, really high level uh, uh, workers, people who want to be civil servants and how they structure their career in such a way that they're actually evaluated positively if they take those risks. That's a complete exception. And you know, in Italy, where I'm from, we had an organization that was actually set up after Mussolini, so not a great start, but it had three phases. It was a big public entity, a state-owned enterprise called IRI. Most Europeans will know about it. It was the Istituto della Ricostruzione Italiana. It had three phases, public, not politicized at all, public, super politicized, so all the different parties put their hands in, and the third phase was privatized. And what's interesting is that the second and third phase were equally disastrous. So the big you know, point of the book is stop going back to this public versus private, state versus uh, business and really pay attention to the governance issue. If we want purpose at the center, both private and public need to change how they're operating and how they're governed and also relate to each other in a very different way from how they currently do. That's fascinating. Well, it's a, it ties in very well. By the way, I should say briefly that, you know, if you want reasons to be cheerful, um, the Biden administration, one of the very interesting things they did when they got into position was basically immediately start the Office for Science Technology Policy, yeah. which had been left completely unstaffed under Trump um, for a long time. Um, they pointed ahead, they made the head the uh, member of the cabinet, putting emphasis on science, and then wrote this letter to him, basically more or less saying, we want to replicate what Franklin Roosevelt did all those years ago by harnessing science and bringing together public and private. But in many ways, um, it's an astonishing moment to have had that zeitgeist shift, which yeah. suggests you might be tiptoeing in your direction. But picking up on this theme about treating government as a venture capital operation in a way, accepting risk and um, success and failure, we got a very interesting question from Maurizio, which says, what kind of work is the IIPP doing or interested in doing support private sector players like venture capital firms mm -hmm. to behave in a more symbiotic way with governments to have a fairer allocation of risks and returns in the innovation process between VC and state. 
to play a more constructive role in the mission economy? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. And the broader question is, what do we do about finance more broadly? And, you know, what are the ideas about restructuring it? A, so it actually fuels finance to the real economy. And B, when it does that, like VC, of course, does venture capital, how to make sure that we structure it so there's a really a sharing of both risks and rewards. And one of the problems with venture capital is this 220 model, right? That, you know, even when all goes wrong, you still get 2% and then they get 20% when things go well isn't always necessarily fair in terms of who did what. So of course, venture capital has been central, for example, to the biotech sector, but that was on the back of about 20 years of National Institute of Health funding. And people sometimes forget how much funding that is. That's about 40 billion currently a year of, you know, of, of public funding that goes into drug innovation. And you'll have you know, Kleiner Perkins, a large venture capital company investing in a company like Genentech, um, and if you look at where, uh, and sorry, and making huge amounts of money. And if you look at the success of Genentech and where a lot of the technology and the research came from, it was also not only, this isn't again about state versus private, also massively from that kind of public investment that preceded venture capital because venture capital is often not really as risk averse as it pretends to be, hardly ever comes in the really, really early stage. Most of these government investments that I talk about in these different sectors what is interesting about them is that they're in the very early stage, high risk, high capital intensive phase before the private sector gets its guts up to invest in. So the question is not state versus private, but you know, over the timeline, given that the state often takes the biggest risk, why is it that we haven't thought more clearly about how to share those rewards? And one of the issues with VC would be, you know, can it still be a profitable sector, but take less of a cut because the cut it's getting is shared more broadly. And, you know, the top VC managers that I've spoken to buy into this. Um, and it's really about also looking at the long run. So if you aren't sharing the rewards, those very public pots that VC itself and the companies themselves have relied on could potentially slowly get more and more diminished, right? If we're not refueling the public budgets with a share of the, uh, you know, of the rewards. Now, of course, one could argue, especially if you look at the moon landing, and I do talk about the whole MMT debate in the US, right? The MMT debate is where lots of people like Stephanie Kelton, a good friend of mine say, look, stop talking about tax or rewards. You don't need that. Government, at least in a country with its own sovereign currency can, as it does when we go to war, just create the money. You've never heard a government say, oh God, we don't have tax. We can't go to Afghanistan, right? You know, we don't have enough tax revenue. They just go, they create the money. And, you know, that's, that's right, actually. Uh, the problem is that it's right theoretically, politically, it becomes a very hard thing to manage. So I think that we need to always balance the argument. What I tend to say is as long as what you're investing in, whether it's, again, health innovation, uh, uh, the digital uh, divide kind of directed innovation, or just AI in general, if it's fueled by a really dynamic, well-structured innovation system, chances are that if you're creating the money to do that, you will also create huge amounts of long run growth, right? The long run driver of GDP are these kinds of investments. So even though in the short run, you're increasing your debt and your deficit, the, re the relationship between debt and GDP will be kept in check. If instead you're just throwing public money, you know, helicopter money out into the system without having that organizational capacity and the system of innovation, across the whole innovation chain that I argue for, then chances are that actually by creating this money and just flooding the system with liquidity or spending here and there, it's actually not gonna cause growth. And that's where you get into a pickle, <laughs> as I would say here, because you've simply increased the debt without increasing the GDP. So another very relevant question um, from a Ewan, how, if at all, does a Robert Gordon hypothesis on the quotes, end of innovation mm. affect your project? Does it require new technological innovation or the application of existing technologies? So I've never been a fan of the whole concept of secular stagnation and this idea that somehow we have lower opportunities. What's really interesting if you look at the data is that for example, back in the day when there was the whole electrification revolution, that wouldn't have actually affected productivity increases in innovation across the whole economy had there not also been big demand pull uh, uh, innovation. So a colleague of mine, Carlotta Perez talks a lot about this. She says that without suburbanization, the mass production revolution wouldn't have created the growth that it did. So in some ways, this kind of stagnation of growth that we've witnessed uh, 
in recent years, one could argue, at least in the two decades, the whole kind of productivity paradox, computers are everywhere, but not in the productivity statistics. You know, if you really look at the kind of lack of ambitious, both supply side, but also demand side policies to act as a funnel through which this immense power and opportunity of IT could have really affected how we you know, produce, how we distribute, how we consume, one could argue that it hasn't had that ambitious demand pull that previous decades have. And that's one of the reasons why we have been arguing that the green agenda has to be just as much about demand side pull precisely so all this great opportunities around data, AI and IT can really get completely diffused throughout the economy. Um, but the other thing is, you know, I speak also to a lot of corporates um, and when you do have these problems around financialization, so these examples that I gave before of share buybacks, right? Excessive share buybacks. So some companies, including Pfizer, by the way, uh, sometimes are investing you know, close to 100% of their net income on share buybacks, actually dipping into uh, capital reserves. The, the answer is there's no opportunities for investment. And I sometimes find that this argument, the academic argument about secular stagnation is complemented in a problematic way by the argument within the corporate sector of justifying short-termism and value extraction with this idea of there's no opportunities. And then you look at the SDGs, you look at the crisis we're facing now, you look at the green, the lack of a proper green transition, those are immense opportunities for innovation and investment. There's no lack of opportunities. The problem is that by not having those kind of conditionalities that I mentioned before, which can also be conditionalities around tax and you know, paying your fair share of tax, paying workers proper wages, but definitely investing in the green transition, then you don't necessarily have the incentive to change and to invest and to innovate. Right. Well, we got a, we, we haven't got that much longer, but we got some really other great questions, both about sort of you personally, your views personally, but also about some of the equity issues and about some practical examples of where to apply this. Let me start with this. A question from Nancy, two related questions. I listened to you on start of the week where there was some talk of wealth creators without defining carefully. Disappointingly, it finished with Vince Cable's assertion that we need the rich, mm. implying I think that they were the wealth creators. I'm interested in your thoughts on this and what you think the role of labor is in wealth creating. And then also related to that, um, question from Kimmy, how important is it to have a reasonable level of social equality if your plan system to work effectively? There must be broad buy-in from the population for government to be mm. able to implement it and widening inequality would be a hindrance. Good, great points. One on labor, one on what I'll talk about as citizen engagement. Um, so uh, I couldn't agree more with the uh, point being made in the uh, first question. And, and this is actually a point I made yesterday with this Davos session where there was all this talk about stakeholder value, but it seemed to be tinted by this idea that stakeholder value is about corporates giving back that, you know, the value that they're, creating and the rewards from that to different actors, whether it's workers, you know, investing in worker training programs, communities, planet, and so on. And I kind of stopped the conversation there. I said, hold on, if you actually believe that value is only created in business and then can be shared through the stakeholder value notion, then I don't think that's stakeholder value. Stakeholder value is about actually having an idea, a belief, but it has to be a true belief. It can't be tokenistic, that value is actually created collectively and so must also be shared collectively. Um, and of course, we can also bring in other concept of justice. So even if someone isn't creating any value for whatever reason, we can also bring in reasons for ethics and, and morality that we would wanna make sure that everyone is, is sharing in those rewards. But that's also why I think that the narrative and the story matters so much. So if you think of universal basic income, something that's being talked about globally, I might, and I do, I am supportive of the policy, but the narrative around it is the old one. It's like a handout, right? Wealth creation is done by the entrepreneurs, by you know, global finance. And then we need to make sure that everyone gets a check in the mail to make sure they have some sort of you know, basic income to live on. It's very different to transform that to the idea of a citizen's share or a citizen's dividend. Just the word citizen's share, citizen's dividend is very different from universal basic income in terms of the narrative of who's kind of creating wealth. Um, and, a, and then just focusing on labor, I mean, this is the real stakeholder capitalism, right? And we know how to do it. Scandinavia has been doing it for a long time, as are many companies in Germany, workers are actually on the board of companies. They help make these long run decisions about investment or any sacrifice uh, 
that workers might have to make for a given year in terms of not getting a, a pay rise that's always in exchange for something that they will benefit from. So it's a, it's, it's a real negotiation and that's because they're seen as essential in the ability of a corporation or a company of any size to create value. And what's interesting is so many companies that do talk at Davos about purpose and stakeholder value would never agree to having workers on the board, right? So I think we need to get much more serious about the kind of the walk of the talk of stakeholder capitalism. And you know, that's not necessarily something that every company has to do, but how do we really disrupt the status quo, not only in terms of these issues of distribution, but really in terms of how we understand that wealth creation process in the first place. Um, and secondly, you know, I spent a lot of time in the book, uh, there's a whole chapter on this about you know, the reason that we're not actually today talking about the old style Apollo kind of technocratic top down program is that the challenges that we're facing are much more wicked. You know, they require huge amounts of political change, regulatory change, and they are at the heart of societal problems that we face like polluted cities um, and, and the other examples I gave. And it's very hard, I think, to galvanize that catalytic investment in innovation that Apollo did if you know, citizens are simply told, you are gonna now live in a carbon neutral city, you know, this is good for you. So how do you, you know, use actually new democratic fora like citizen assemblies or do what we're doing in the Camden Renewal Commission, which is to really create some very interesting debate with citizens in Camden about what it would look like, for example, to uh, make the housing estates, what in America they call projects, uh, the center of a carbon neutral agenda. Or again, coming back to that issue of school meals, how would you bring kids and students into that so it actually feeds through the curriculum, but also they become you know, active monitors of whether this system, this change is actually working or not. So the whole issue of citizen engagement, I think is huge. And the fact that we're living through not only the COVID moment, not only the climate change moment, but also the moment where movements, I think have really been revived. If you think of the Black Lives Matter movement, the Fridays for the Future movement, I think there's a huge opportunity to really bring these movements to the core of the discussions of how to, again, build back better, but not in a tokenistic way where we just pat you know, Greta Thornburg on the head, <laughs> but actually bring even this to the curriculum of civil servants. And you know, that's kind of empathy 101. How do you listen and not fear a movement, but really you know, absorb some of the key things that are being asked for and bring those into the design, this kind of social innovation part of it. Well, I've got sort of three other quick questions I want to get to if we can before we run out of time. One of which is um, someone called Claudia, who's a great fan of yours, is very upset about the fact that you recently appeared on an Italian talk show. I think it's Otte Meze, Mezzo, mm. excuse my language. Um, and halfway through the conversation, it was clear that the panelists thought you were talking about communism. Oh. Um, you put it very nicely <laughs> in their place. But how do you keep your cool and keep on fighting with your arguments when there are people who just don't get it? and assume that what you're talking about is communism? Well, um, I mean, you know, it's, it's not a coincidence that we began this conversation by saying this is about getting a better capitalism. There's varieties of capitalism. The whole notion of stakeholder capitalism means we need a different form. And that is what I'm talking about, regardless of what my views might be of all the sort of different types of setups we might have, what, you know, Marx called the the mode of production, regardless what anyone might think, we're currently living in a capitalist system and we can do much, much, much better. And the fact that we have businesses talking about it, we have governments at least pretending to be interested in things like climate or having signed up to this long list of countries on the SDGs, that's where I always bring it back to. I always say, look, are you really interested in the SDGs? Are you really interested in purpose? Well, then let's start you know, actually implementing that. And you have to learn from the ground. It's not about a big theory about communism or capitalism. How can we learn on the ground from, for example, doing procurement differently or doing budgeting differently in an outcomes oriented way and then start scaling up the lessons at a higher level? And we call that in the Institute, I run practice-based theorizing. Through practice, you learn how to do things better and then you bring it back to the theory of how the system works. And so when I get that pushback, which of course the Financial Times and the Economist you know, will often argue that same line, which is yes, the state is needed, but hey, be careful, big state, that's Soviet, that's the great leap forward, that's you know, going back to the Concord, which failed. You know, that is just such an easy <laughs> critique that I think we always have to push back ourselves and say, well, let's look at Concord actually and what exactly went wrong. Mm. Right. Well, we get a very interesting question from David Bent um, saying, 
what do you think is the strongest argument made in good faith against the core thesis of your book? Who is making it? And how do you respond? So that's a fantastic question. I like how it's framed. Um, you know, there's all sorts of uh, critiques to any argument one can make, but I think the ones that I uh, find less useful are the ones that I was just mentioning, which goes back to, you know, oh, this is capitalism versus communism, or it's a picking winners problem, Concord this, you know, British Leyland that, you know, examples of projects or Solyndra, which I went over before. The more interesting ones are, you know, what do you do, for example, in countries that have just really weak states, right? You can think of some African countries that I'm currently working with like South Africa. This is a huge dilemma. You know, isn't it just much easier just to privatize, right? And you know, one can argue all against privatization, but if you currently have you know, a high degree of corruption or lack of capacity, what do you do? And you know, those questions are really smart and they're really interesting because it's a dilemma. What do you do? And you know, those are you know, a, a questions that we're working with right now with President Ramaphosa's team and the, and the advisory council. It's a, it's a wonderful team. And you know, what does it mean to change how you think about ownership, state ownership, for example, ESCOM, a large energy company in South Africa owned by the state, which hasn't been owned through a lens of transformation, right? Of a kind of you know, green transformation of the country. And the fact that you own a state asset could actually give you more leeway to actually cause that transition if instead you're using that ownership for staying in place, for giving power to the incumbents, what does it look like to change how you govern? This of course was, a, I think, a huge question also here in the UK when we went back to the dichotomy of you know, Corbyn wanting to nationalize, uh, uh, say transport or other sectors and other ones saying, no, this has to remain free market. That's an old debate. What does it mean to govern even private ownership, for example, of state, uh, sorry, of transport in a way though that is conditional on the private sector actually investing and in making the transport system here modern, green, and so on, which again is not part of how we're currently governing UK transport. So, so I think like I always find those questions really challenging because it requires you to stop and think and to experiment to, to ask, you know, what are you actually learning on the ground? What I don't find useful is just the, the usual, you know, you can just almost close your eyes and know it's coming, which is, oh, this is about picking winners. And it's not about picking winners, it's not about picking one project one technology, one sector that then you go back to and say, look, that was a mess up. It's about choosing a direction, you know, a green direction, for example, and then picking the willing, not picking the winners. Again, designing procurement grants and loans that really crowd in all the different types of companies that are willing to move with you, but not to just stay in place and get some sort of government handout. Well, just very briefly, because we're almost out of time. I wanted to get granular at the end and specific and simply say we got one question from Luciana saying she's writing from Venice, Italy and wants to know whether you think the Italian government's aware of the scale of climate change threatening mm -hmm. Venice and a question, a very practical question from Steve, which I think will probably touch many people watching, which is how should places like Rotherham where I live fix their disintegrating high streets town centres? Sorry, was the city Rotterdam? No, Rotherham. Brother, I'm sorry. Um, so Venice, yeah, I mean, everyone knows that there's a, a climate problem uh, all over Italy. In Venice, of course, you'll remember that just before COVID hit, which for many of us was in March, even though it was, you know, in, in the previous months, we were just blind to it. Uh, in February, there was huge floods in Venice. Um, they were all over the papers just the month before. No one's talking about that anymore. It's not that their problem's not there, right? We've just been kind of blinded by this other big crisis. And if you look at the failures in Italy, but I, I don't think it's fair just to point to Italy, but definitely in the Veneto region, which by the way is where I'm from. My family's from Padova, which is 10 minutes from Venice. Um, it, it's often really been a massive governance failure. You know, and this is actually why the whole moon landing thing is interesting. You know, if we could get to the moon and back, <laughs> we can surely solve at least some of these problems, at, at least those that aren't wicked, right? So there's this famous book called The Moon and the Ghetto written by a friend of mine, Richard Nelson. That's, you know, that poses a really important question, which is we got to the moon and we still haven't solved the ghetto problem, inequality. The answer to that is different from the one I'm, you know, that we're talking about here, where there's floods, there's definitely scientific and technological solutions to that, but we're not treating them with the urgency that we treated, you know, going to the moon and back because it was to beat the Russians. Um, and sorry, I've already forgotten the second one. What was the second one? 
Yes. Well, the high streets, and we are just. About oh yeah, yeah, the high streets. So we actually wrote a report uh, for the London mayor around the high street, and, and and argued that we really could benefit from this concept that I mentioned before around public value, um, which has in some you know organizations like the BBC been debated, but not really. Like, how do you create value together in a high street, right? So with all the, for example, the land and the business rates that um, you know, companies are paying back, say, to the high street, uh, uh, you know, to a part of a city, what would it look like to actually really have a debate and a discussion of what we're even trying to achieve on a high street beyond just kind of retail that sort of comes and goes, often increasingly driven by private equity funding, which by definition is just looking for a short-term return. What would it look like, again, to have that place-based innovation in the same way that I talked about a school meal as a place through which you could just galvanize all sorts of different innovation investment, but at that high street level. So it's, it's on the web. You look, you can, I think it's called London High Streets and it's funded by the mayor, Sadiq Khan. Nice. And we have a chapter on it that brings this mission oriented approach. Well, thank you. That's really fascinating. Sadly, very sadly, we are out of time. We got through most of the questions. Apologies to anyone who didn't get their question answered because they were terrific questions. And it just remains for me to say a big thank you, Mariana. I think thank you. I find it very inspiring both to hear about the scale of the ambition that you're calling for us to adopt, which has been there before, but has often been forgotten recently, but also about the specific granular implications of what it can mean, whether it's in a high street, whether it's on something like Venice, whether it's a BBC, all these very specific granular areas of our life that could become so much better if only we thought big and also frankly thought lateral because the other point oh, you make that's a good point. is it's no good thinking about so-called stakeholder capitalism, the new buzzword of the age that we've both been talking about in Davos, unless you recognize that stakeholders all need to try and interact and basically all sides learn from each other. And that's been rather the missing piece in the last um, few years. But thank you very much indeed for a very uplifting, inspiring session. Um, I'm, I have to tell everyone watching that you can give your feedback um, to the about the discussion at the feedback button on the screen and tell the British Library what you think about this event. Um, be as rude as you like, because I won't be probably have to <laughs> see it. But in the meantime, very best of luck in getting this message out for all of our sakes. And good luck with the book. Thank you. Thank you, Jillian. And such a great summary, as always. You're wonderful. <laughs> and thanks to the British Library. <laughs>